Okay. I, I come to accessibility uh, a bit later, right? It's um, so I want to talk a bit about my journey first, and then we will be talking about this idea of accessibility. Does it have a problem in VR? And um, so let me see. So I've worked um, on systems and perception before, right? This is kind of how I enter VR, uh, creating this, you know, drone that is uh, developing this um, tool that will give you a stereoscopic vision to drive a drone or, you know, this type of uh, very system oriented type of experiences. And, and very rapidly as you're working on VR, you see perception is a big part of it, right? Like the human on the loop is the, almost the most unknown part of VR. And, and things like how will people engage with the spatial audio? How can we measure latency uh, through tasks that people are performing? Um, then I've worked a lot on avatars, uh, a lot of it on during my PhD, uh, basically measuring this idea of embodiment. You can substitute your body in a virtual reality. Uh, how do you do that? Uh, how do you measure this? I was doing a lot of electrophysiology. Um, and then I figure out, oh, it correlates very well with questions, but no one is using the same questions. So we should have a standardized questionnaire. I work uh, with Tabitha Peck on standardizing questionnaires, uh, which is this one here. Uh, finally, 16 questions, which we have validated with over 400 uh, participants across many experiments. I have also realized that a lot of more people should be working with avatars, but they don't have the tools. So I've been in the last two years open sourcing a lot of assets around this uh, rocket bus library of avatars, which are like normal people and they are rigged, easy to use, right? So they are very nice to also study in behavior, um, which I think is also a very interesting part of VR, right? Like will people behave normally with other people? And also you can use avatars to simulate the scenarios that would be impossible in reality, right? Like you cannot go to a bar and start a bar fight to see if someone is going to intervene. Um, but in, in virtual reality, you can do that and have multiple confounders, right? Like more people are in the bar or the person who is uh, being uh, um, harassed is wearing a jacket of your same uh, hockey team or, you know, so you have some uh, bystander effects, some um, uh, in-group, out-group effects, you know, very interesting things, but I don't have time to explore everything. Uh, so I think open sourcing assets is a very important part of, of the things we need to do. And then I've worked on haptics, which I think is very relevant also to accessibility, right? This idea that you can touch uh, objects and, and um, interact with them with your um, own body, right? So one of the publications that I really recommend reading in general is this one uh, with Jaron Lanier on how to produce these illusions, why illusions in VR work so well, um, and then some theories about how it doesn't work. But I think our work on haptics that is more relevant is perhaps the work we've done on, on controllers, which is very explosive in a way, and we're trying to create illusions that um, allow you to have this type of experience, right? You're grabbing an object, you move it, you can interact with it. Um, you can perhaps uh, grab an object from a tree, like an apple. Um, and then you need to create these different devices uh, that will allow you to, to create this type of interactions or uh, feel the compliance of an object, right? I'm grabbing a, a ball and I need to feel it has some elasticity on it. And there are all sorts of very interesting mechanisms. We work on it. Um, there are many other controllers we've done. And I actually, I won't talk more about this, but I think it's interesting for accessibility and Mike Sinclair or AL Effect from my team can come another day perhaps and, and talk more about the implications of uh, haptics for accessibility. So what we see is that, and I think everybody will agree, VR has this incredible potential for accessibility, right? Because you can do things that are impossible outside VR. VR as a general thing, VR, AR, spatial computing, right? So, and there are some things that are clear. You can 
augment when vision. So cardio a person can see things that they could not see with their bare eyes uh, using, for example, computer vision. And this is one example of an experiment. We did a, a system we built uh, which allows you to figure out the heart rate of a person by um, with the cameras, you can do um, the composition of the RGV and then figure out your heart rate. So, and then also by how you move your head. So when you're talking to someone, it can display information that you didn't have, right? And, uh, and this could have effects on how you interact with other people, uh, perhaps while you're on an operation room or, or other situations, right? So this idea of augmenting the vision that you can see things that you cannot see before that. And also this idea that we have many more sensors like eye tracking. So you could use that to assist people with, uh, for example, cognitive disabilities in, in, um, in improving things, right? Like here, for example, I'm, I'm making this, helping this person resolve a puzzle by uh, relocating uh, pieces when I see they are looking somewhere else, right? So it's a gaze-oriented assisted uh, interaction, right? So, uh, and there are many other applications of these, but, um, you know, there could be things um, all around the accessibility side that have to do with new sensors, right? Um, around this idea of seeing things that you cannot see in reality, and I think uh, seeing with sound was one of the first um, projects that was trying to explore this, and Microsoft Research uh, recently uh, released this Scene AI, which you can download in the App Store, and it has all these intelligent built things like can read text for you, can recognize people, can uh, turn the visual world into audio, and you know it's it's also on this idea of mobile computing rather than VR computing. But I think it's just because people have phones that we're targeting for products that go into the phones. But all of these uh, would make total sense on a wearable too. And then things like a spatial sound is changing how we do GPS, for example, and we've been working on this. For a bit. on our mobile phones have certainly allow us to go further and reach and explore places. However, so one of the problems, for example, with current GPS is turn by turn is something that is really not useful for a blind person. Turn right, turn left. From respect to what? I'm in the middle of a crossing. I need to pay attention to many other things, right? So um, we've been uh, creating this idea of beacons for audible navigation in which you sort of hear this spatial sound coming from somewhere, like if it was a church or a minaret uh, emitting some sound and you can just walk there, right? So let me show a bit. This is the app here, and this is a person using it. And this person is trying to go to a particular location, right? So um, they're, very interesting effects also on, on the spatial maps you create. Um, and I think this is a very good example of a tool that was created for accessible use, but then we find out that it also improves the abilities of a spatial uh, understanding and spatial awareness of people who are not blind. Okay, so and you can read more about this and we publish also in Scientific American a, a piece about this. But okay, apart from bringing this new experience, we're not really making it accessible yet, right? Like we're solving some problems that people are having uh, around the real world by augmenting the, the real world for them. But it doesn't mean that the technology is accessible. So one of the first things we can do, and I think we've been quite okay at envisioning this, but not as good at standardizing this, is transferring things we're already doing in other tech. Right, like visual help, high contrast, magnifiers, read loud, uh, uh, all of these, or copilot assistance. Um, so actually, I saw Yuhan is in the in the audience here. Yuhan Zhao, who is currently a professor in Wisconsin, she was one of our students and uh, interns a couple of years back, and she created this toolkit. Um, which I found really great, right? Because it's transferring things we know are necessary and people use in other technologies into VR. And particularly in VR, there are some things that are more challenging, right? Like breathing uh, with a very low quality 
uh, uh, screens, they are improving, but still it's bad even for me. So I might, you know, the, the technology is also making it less accessible for people who uh, even on other, in a normal screen wouldn't need a magnifier, perhaps in VR they need it. Uh, and there are many of these things that you can do in CNVR. What I really liked about this tool, and I think it's a methodology we should explore for almost every new tool we're building for VR, is one, it kind of looked at what the tools are being used there, right? And, and whether this tool would work on different games. And second, um, it built on top of existing games. So you can actually put this on a game that already exists and improve it, right? So you don't need those game developers to uh, create all of this for themselves. So this is very easy to uh, put on every game, even on a game that is already there. Not everything works, but many of these things are actually shaders or things that you can implement uh, at the rendering time. And it's available online. So one of the problems is that this is great, but not every game or every tool has it, right? So we need to make it a standard. Um, another example of an interesting tool is this uh, idea of copilot assistance. This happens in reality, right? Uh, many people will go with someone else, so they help them, right? Um, and even in incorporate scenarios, many people with disabilities will have an assistant to help them assist with things, right? Like organizing meetings or things that are not really mission critical in terms of um, your job, but really needed to perform it, right? So you have an assistant who will help you with that. And there is a paper from last year on a workshop of um, uh, seated VR, uh, by Anthony Steed and uh, Felix uh, Thiel from UCL already working on this. And it's not a simple fact, right? Because you, you want to have um, perhaps in a venue or whatever, you go with someone and that person brings you, like you go together and that means that they can assist you opening doors or, or other things also in VR, right? So that's also something that we do in other, in reality, not only on computing tech, uh, so we have to get a bit inspired by these things that we already do and implement them, right? So the problem with these two things is that they're not everywhere and they're not standardized. And I'm sure there are more of these, right? So this is one approach we can have is thinking of things we're doing already either in real life or in other technology and bring it to VR. And even with that, I actually preparing for this talk, I, I put this question on the internet Perhaps I already have more people voting, but I think even with more people voting, the answer is quite clear right now, <laughs> right? I think most people agree that there is a problem. And I mean, this is a rhetorical question. Everybody agrees. And we have, I had people like Mark Billinghurst or uh, Blair uh, McIntosh who have been very active in the community answering here and actually engaging with the post. Um, saying their their part right and and they've been um, quite clear that yes there is a problem so first we should I think understand why there is a problem right and I think we're it's because of this paradigm shift we're moving from this idea that the content is inside the screen is contained there to this idea that the user is inside the content and that is changing how we interact uh, and and we interact through our body and we're also using wearable tech and both things are very very compli com complicated for certain uh, accessible reasons right which are what if you have a bodily disability you cannot interact with your body normally uh, and what if you can put it on right you cannot even put the technology on so you're really on a uh, not going to be able to engage with this new technology so I think we are landing this inclusion paradox. I think it's the first time we have a better computing in a way that is less inclusive. And it's, it's really because perhaps we have to rethink about it. Perhaps we don't need this one-to-one -one body interaction. Is it really needed? Uh, can we have abstractions of it uh, from locomotion? Do you really need to walk around VR? Can you use the controller? Like, um, you know, people use different type of mouses 
uh, if you cannot move your hands or uh, eye gaze or so all of these things perhaps are ways of uh, bypassing the embodied interaction and then wearability so I, I'm very good friends with uh, Lara Trutoyu and she told me about this wearability index she's pursuing and I was like oh this is such a great idea right and I, also I, I see this is her across her life uh, build this prototype on the top put a you know, a coil in her eye, plenty of things. So I'm, I'm kind of not surprised. She's kind of um, gone into this wearability index, but I think it's very important, right? And there are things around it, like, can you put it on, which is a very basic of wearability, but also for how long and all these aspects of where will, will it allow you to continue doing things in reality? The, the, those of things that should go on a wearability index, which I think is a very incipient idea, but uh, is certainly important. So we can have a, a, a range of understanding of a scale of what things can, can be used or not from an accessibility perspective. And then I think for all the people that cannot do wearable, we need to think of backward compatibility and hybrid scenarios, right? This idea that some people will be fully immersive in VR, AR, and, but we need to allow cross-device interactions, right? For people who will not be able to wear it. And I think uh, in general, the industry is thinking sort of well about this. Um, there's different approaches. Some are clearly VR first and spatial computing first, and some are less, um, more agnostic, let's say, right? So for example, Mesh is really thinking of you will have cross device, right? Some people will be on their computers, some people will be on, on their a headset and a spatial too, right? In general, many of these tools will have a desktop version of it. And we should make sure of that because a lot of people will not be able to wear things. And then the other problem that we were talking about this embodied interaction, this one-to-one -one mapping of our body motions, do we really need it, right? So I think uh, there are few aspects here that I have explored, but there are many more, right? One is hand interactions. Hand interactions are critical in embodied interaction. What do we do with our hands? So I, I'll talk about a bit of, of this and also present a bit of a methodology that I think could, could be helpful for other parts of embodied interaction. Things that have to do with the full body and also with locomotion, right? Which is a critical thing in VR. So for embodied in, uh, hand interaction, we uh, have Momona join us uh, two years back and uh, with Martes Mott, who was my office mate. And actually, I think he's the reason why I became more interested on accessibility. Um, and we did this work together, actually. So this was interesting. And I think, again, look at what is out there already. Um, we started thinking about how do people use their hands? Um, we, th we thought, okay, there is this idea of symmetric in face, like you're gonna grab a barrel, you will use both hands at the same time. Uh, symmetric out of face, like you're climbing. So you'll use more or less the same thing, but one hand at a time. Uh, then things like symmetric uh, coordinated in which one hand assists the other hand, like, uh, drawing with a hand, one will be holding the paper, the other will be painting, holding your phone and then interacting on the phone. And then things that are asymmetric and uncoordinated, like two swords, right? Like they will move completely independent. So we look at all these popular games and we find that different occurrences in, in different of the um, options, right? And this uh, histogram, it's very interesting because already tells you a lot of what is the most needed thing, right? And it's gonna be a limitation for many people. And here we see that, for example, asymmetric coordinated movements are a winner. It's like they are all over the place. Almost 50% of the um, tasks that you have to do 
are on on coordinated asymmetric and bear in mind we're talking about vr games because it's, vr is still an early adopter type of thing and gamers are always the early adopters but this is a problem that will happen when we start writing documents and doing excel spreadsheets and you know all sort of things that will happen inside vr uh, could uh, mirror this um, histogram so there are some examples of these asymmetric coordination things that we need to do. And then we went a bit uh, more into this design space and we were like, okay, what if we offer computer assistance, right? So then we can have these coordinated actions and coordinated actions. And if we don't have the computer assistance, then we'll have more synchronous or we could have asynchronous things that will allow you to interact better right so i i would say um some of them um are easier to solve right and with computer assistance is basically just inferring where the virtual hand will be with machine learning and i'll show a bit of that just now um and without the computer assistance that's actually also a very interesting space that um gives more control and i'll show some examples of it but in general if you put the assistance you have less user less effort from the user but you have also decreased autonomy and if you don't have computer assistance there is more effort from the user but you can increase autonomy so we went into the non-computer assistant really so here we have things like okay we kind of hold a trigger in the nearby of somewhere right so you don't need to really be there and it infers where you're going like okay i have all this wall and there is this place where you need to hold your hand so clearly that's where you're gonna hold your hand right so there is a bit of inference there are things where you can have a head tracking and and with the headset you point where you want to go and then trigger and there are things that uh, are interesting like this mode switch you only use one hand and then with that hand you can control either hand right like now you're on the right hand and now you're gonna sh uh, control the virtual left hand with your right hand so those were just some examples of uh, possible ways to to have uh, different interactions and, and one thing that i've learned is that there are so many ways to do the same thing uh, that is it's um, really incredible and we'll we'll see about that when we go to locomotion but i want to finish with the embodied interaction by showing other ways in which we are actually getting rid of this one-to-one -one mapping and just inferring things okay so and this happens all over the place right now because vr controllers we have two controllers and one headset but we want to reconstruct the whole body right so how do we do that and um we, we propose cool moves a virtual reality system that so this is an example of a, a tool where we have a motion bank or um a database of motions and then we can have a trajectory of where your hands are and do a nearest neighbor match for each of the bones and reconstruct the rest of the skeleton with inverse kinematics and then for each of the bones also run um, uh, a nearest neighbor so at the end we will have an out uh, that it reconstruct the whole body based on this and of course at some uh, smoothing so it's a nice motion so there are a few things that are interesting about this one is that we reconstruct from limited input and this limited input is one but you know we could have much limiter input um, that is um, uh, more of the interest right and then the other thing is that you can have infinite versions because if nothing is there on the database we fall back to inverse kinematics uh, and that allows you to really reconstruct with very limited motion. So out of these three motions, we're reconstructing this full thing on the top. And the reality is that it's, I mean, it's not even in the database, some of the actions that the person is doing, right? So you can, um, other interesting uh, applications of this database approach is that you could change the mood of someone 
um, the how good you are at something, right? I mean, this is something. This was actually the original reason why we started this project. Is wow, I'm gonna play a tennis game, and I'm super bad at tennis. And this is just ridiculous. Why am I going to play this game, right? If I'm playing Rafa Nadal, I will lose all the time, right? So uh, the idea here is that you would get assistance in your motions through the database. And the reality is that everything that becomes an assistance or a personalization problem, it's very useful for accessibility. So here we're improving the emotions of this person who doesn't know how to dance so well, right? And of course, we were saying this before, the more we add on the computer heuristic side, the less uh, control we feel we have. And that was also a challenge for us. And then we can reconstruct legs, which is something interesting, right? Uh, that would be very useful for particular populations when they don't wanna show they have a disability. But we need to be careful with that because many people don't want to lose their identity, right? So we might want to stylize themselves or their movements, recover them from a database or from a limited input to recreate an avatar that no one will notice anything is uh, missing there. Um, but some people might want to do this in particular situations, but many of them, they, they are happy with their identity and it's part of their identity, their disability. So we should also consider having avatars that have wheelchairs and things, right? So this representation matters is also um, something we need to be careful in, in VR. And particularly this idea of reconstruction from limited input is very important because some of the disabilities just you get tired very quickly, right? So this embodied interaction is more about, I wanna do much smaller motions or, um, it's, it's, you know, I have a shaking on my motion. Can you recover that without the shake? And it's, it's not just a smoothing filter, right? And now I wanna go to one of the latest problems I will show on embodied interaction, which is there for everyone is you have this amazing virtual world, a whole city, New York City, virtual, great. This is your room and you're gonna cross the pedestrian crossing and you don't even make it to the end of the crossing, right? So locomotion is a very critical problem for VR. Um, so I started working on this a couple of years back and it's like, oh, how do we solve this? Okay, let's think of ways. And, and there were With so many tracking. ways to solve this, right? Like you could um, make people be a giant. Great. It's actually a great experience. Um, it feels great. Or go super fast. Um, and you can make them go fast on, on velocity or on acceleration. And it's a bit different uh, when you try it. You don't see it really well on, on just... Uh, like this, but the reality is that when you're doing this, you can read the door name. Okay, this is the dentistry I'll enter. But when you're a giant, you cannot, right? It's uh, but in exchange, you have this better experience that you're a full body versus the other thing is like, where is my body? Is my head at the height of the road? It feels weird. Um, so every single thing that you invent, every single locomotion technique will have some pros and cons. And this trigger a later work that I did with Max and Hasty um, on exploring locomotion techniques, right? And, and we started, Max and I, and we were like, oh, how many are there? <laughs> and, and as we were piling up, we were like, there is no way we can put this anywhere, right? We, this needs to be an interactive tool to visualize it. Otherwise you're never gonna be able to, um, to understand what you're seeing. So that's when we enrolled Hasty because uh, you know she had done the Haptipedia and other of these similar tools and we decided to go this way. So a few things about the locomotion bolt. Um, you know, there are all these tools and there will be families of locomotion techniques, right? Like all of these are 
uh, have to do with teleportation. All of these are like on a vehicle. These ones are room scale. And, and you can go through all of them and you can find it online. And it's great because then you can also go and say, see more details, see what games have it, right? Like, oh, you can uh, play this on, on this particular game and try it for real. And in fact, we tried all of them ourselves. Uh, and then the interesting thing is that you can start saying like, oh, I want something that provides high spatial awareness. Therefore, teleportation is all gone because it's very bad for spatial awareness and has low nausea. And then you end up with only these ones, right? And if you end up putting more uh, restrictions, you, you just have this one particular uh, locomotion techniques that, that fits you well. Um, so I want to show a bit how we went through this, right? Because we were like, okay, we could have a taxonomy, but really I think taxonomies are perhaps too widely used and they have this problem. Your taxonomy should be able to describe everything that you know and everything you don't know about some particular field, right? So it should give is ideas of gaps in knowledge around you. And we, we were really not ready to do that. And in fact, there are so many taxonomies about locomotion that you, you realize that nobody's ready to do that. So we started looking at other taxonomies and what things they were looking at and what, you know, not even all of them look at everything and, and what attributes they were considering for each of the locomotion techniques. And then we define, okay, we're gonna use these, lo these attributes and spatial awareness is one that I think it's, it's very important in general uh, because otherwise you just don't create a mental map of, of whatever you're going, right? And these are how many papers they were on the particular entries. And then there were some meta attributes like, oh, can you find it in this video game? Or there is a video showing it, or this guy created it, or when was it created? Or, you know, things like that. And so we have this metadata and these attributes. And one of them is very important is the category, right? And so we started analyzing more things. And I think once you have, right, we have over a hundred different techniques, then you can start to do interesting data analysis. So one very basic one is, wow, it's exploding, right? The, the field is exploding ever since Oculus. Uh, there are many more options. And the one that is more common is movement, right? Different types of movement that will help you locomote. Uh, and, you know, but all of them are increasing. And I think things like uh, gesture will increase much more now that we have hand tracking on the systems, right? And there are things that will be enabled by, by the technology. And in fact, it's only because we're now having um, good ways to move around in VR that we can do this, right? Like back when Vicky Interante was doing this, he had like a whole laboratory just to, to work on this. And then the other thing that I, we found very interesting is that many of these tools are driven by game development and not by research. So it sort of felt like the research was falling back and we needed to fill that gap. And I think that's happening in many areas of VR. Uh, we need to, as researchers, to look at what's happening on the gaming industry because they are moving so fast, right? So we can learn from them. So some things we did, the multidimensional scaling from the data, right? Like if this one has so many degrees of freedom and la, 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 so it will be located sort of here. And then you can see that, oh, wow, more or less all of these ones were are grabbing techniques are falling together, right? So it sort of validates that you're categorizing correctly things. Um, and this is what we did with the expert knowledge. So it's only three because it's the three of us who tried all the games and all the techniques, and then we classify them in a different way, right? And we try to see whether uh, the expert or the data, and you can, uh, and we created this similarity index. Okay, so you can find that uh, it's, a, it's an interesting way to play with it. So I wanna talk a bit more about this order part, which is a symbolic regression we did. It's just a function that out of all the attributes, how would we will we define the category, right? And then you run this sort of uh, deep um, 
trained network into finding uh, functions of all these attributes. And I mean, you really don't know what this function means. It makes no sense. But what you can see is the number of times the attributes appear on these functions, right? And you see, wow, accessibility seems to be a very important driving force in locomotion, as well as direction and nausea. And, and the other good thing about symbolic regression is that it linearizes everything. And, and you, I mean, we don't know the scale really, what does zero point something mean? I don't care, but you can order it, right? So the order is important. So if you have this score, and this is real life room scale, and then you have things that become less accessible because you need to do more things, different gestures and different movements that become even less accessible than real life, but could reduce nausea, but also might limit your motion, right? Because now you have to do this very particular thing to move, uh, like uh, you move your hand instead of your body or something like that. And then there are things that make it super accessible like a controller and I just move the controller and I, I move around or I'm on a vehicle or I teleport or, you know, like you can see how in effect, yes, uh, but they will start creating more nausea, right? But also you will be able to fly all over the place and move in whatever direction or as fast as you can. So there are some things that are interesting is how nausea and accessibility are very intermingled here. And the one thing that I want to say about the locomotion bolt is that I really think it's an approach that could become kind of like a passport, right? So you have your locomotion techniques and you bring them to games with you uh, or, or whatever you want. You bring your locomotion technique and you bring your avatar and you bring your interaction techniques like the uh, you know, two-hand interaction, whatever works for you, you should be able to bring it to the different games uh, as a passport type of thing. Uh, and that's something that is not currently available, but I think it's something we should work towards and, and could make things more accessible. So personalization of uh, VR, it is indeed um, improving accessibility. And one example is Alex. I don't know if you ever play Alex, um, the VR game. They already have out of the box three different types of locomotions. And, and sometimes you're tired and you want to teleport. And sometimes you want to sort of move around and explore this very particular room that has all these mini gadgets and things you can grab. And it's, it's actually very interesting with the index controller, right? Because they created the controller uh, to have good uh, hand interactions. So they have a lot of mini objects you can grab and, and I think it's part of the game, right? So already games that are out there, they don't know why, but they are ad allowing personalization because this changes how you do this embodied interaction. And I think that that's a key part. And I, I wanna finish with this um, thing of, um, VR is, has this opportunity that we make it accessible by design because we're creating it now, right? It's, it's not like other technologies that were created and then much later we realized accessibility was important. We're creating VR and we know accessibility is important, right? So I think we have this opportunity and I think we need to make noise and to the thing that has happened to me, I wasn't very interested on accessibility and then realized how important it was. I think we need to open the eyes to many other people. And of course, I don't work alone. I work with many people. And, um, and also if, if you're interested on the topic and have some particular idea and you wanna work with us, uh, let us know. Uh, but sometimes if it's something open source, we don't even need to bring you here. We can do it right as a collaboration. Um, and I'm happy to, to work with people all the time. So I, I hope the, the talk wasn't very pessimistic. I think there are ways in which we can improve the accessibility problem, but yes, we do still have an accessibility problem. And that's the end of the talk today. I don't know if there are questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mar Gonzalez. So 
Um, now we have here Mahika Futane with me, and she will be helping me go through the questions that we had. Mm -hmm. um, so if anyone wants to also make any other questions, you can raise your hand or write it on the chat. You can also uh, uh, share your video and speak directly with Dr. Mar Gonzalez if you feel more comfortable with that. But I guess we will start with a question from Jesse, Jesse Anderson. So Jesse said, as someone with nystagmus, how do eye tracking system account for rapid involuntary eye movement? I've heard a, talk, a lot of talk about eye tracking as the future of VR, but this concerns me. Yeah, I think um, many of the sensor systems need to have a, a backup, right? And, and not everything will work for everyone, but because there will be many different sensor systems or interaction techniques. And that's why a bit of, I think the locomotion uh, bolt shows, right? There will be many ways to do the same thing. And every person will have the ability to choose that is ideally uh, what I think. Uh, as to particular effects, I think there are ways this embodied one-to-one -one remapping is something that I think we can, uh, with the heuristics that we were saying before, we can perhaps uh, get uh, about some particular problems it might not work as perfectly fine as other things, but I always think multimodal interaction is, is the, the key, right? Do not rely on just one interaction unless it's a button, right? That is on off. Everything else can have classifying errors. Yeah, thank you for that answer. Um, we had a lot of chat um, chatter in the chat uh, while you were uh, presenting. Um, uh, one of the questions that came up on your um, slide about, you know, embodied like wearable technology, someone was asking, what about, you know, things like pants or shirts for capturing like full body movements? Yeah, I think, uh, um, I think all of these body tracking suits, and you can already use some of these um, uh, vibe trackers, put them around and do inverse kinematics, right? Um, we're focusing on the what people are having generally, which is these two controllers and the headset. The more tracking you have, the better and more accurate you will be towards embodied one-to-one -one mapping. However, I think the one-to-one -one mapping is something that still limits a bit on the accessibility, right? Because many people cannot do the one-to-one -one mapping. Um, so I do think that uh, many of these tools um, that are clothes are also very complex because you need to clean them. I mean, I wouldn't even wear my own gloves after five hours of wearing my gloves. I would want them clean, right? So imagine sharing that or I, I every time someone comes with this idea that I'm going to create a glove, I'm just freaking out because I'm like, well, I'm not really sure because I mean, a headset, you can share it among the peers in your family or, you know, but a, not even a glove. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, just echoing a comment made by Wenji and Michelle. If anyone has a pool of people, I working. see an interesting comment here. What is a computer mouse in a crude form oh. of hand tracking? Correct. Yeah. And I think it's kind of an abstraction. And I think what I'm trying to say is that we need to find abstractions that work well for other people, right? Like if, if this works well for you, this should be your mode of locomotion or your mode of interaction. So whatever it is that your body can do should enable you know, this algebra combination from here to all these, right? So just increase the range and then you have many more options. Going off from that, I think that the question that I made might be interesting to answer 
So the, the idea that we were talking about, about focusing more on designing interactions rather than on the isolated environment, like a video game or an application, and they make it like accessible on the environment itself. What do you think are the biggest challenges to This achieve? A big, yeah, a big problem. So one of them is we need more open source tools. Okay, so people can use them. And I'm actually running an open source workshop in IEEE this year. And there are 16 submissions of things that some of them will be actually very nice for accessibility. I'll share um, in here the link. Um, I haven't posted yet the accepted papers, but it will be soon will be done. Um, One of the challenges I found, for example, the next step for me, natural for locomotion vault, was to implement the techniques so people can use them. The problem is that many of these techniques, I mean, I don't know if they're copyrighted, but certainly have a creator, right? And, and my idea was to have a, you know, like a challenge across universities and students can build one technique each. So it doesn't feel like a big issue. So I wanted to, I actually, I think I contacted uh, Andrea Stevenson, one from Cornell, or, you know, a couple of uh, my uh, typical professors that I work with saying, hey, would you want to do this in your class for undergrads, right? It's great because you can make it tiny, Everybody creates one locomotion techniques. You, you give an architecture of how it should be. So it's, you know, like it's interchangeable. And this is the part you need to implement is inside here, right? Um, and it's, it's a perfect experiment like that because people, you know, you collect a lot of things and everybody just does a little bit. It's a crowdsourcing experience, but you cannot do it because you're not the creator of the tools. And if you're going to release that, it, it's like, it's a bit complex in the terms of, um, and I think that complexity is something we're going to find in, in trying to create uh, this, unless it goes the other way around. The people who are building it make it open source. And once different things are open source, then you start building on top of these blocks And then you create the meta open source tool that has all these things. I think that's kind of like if you look at OpenCV, Open Computer Vision that, you know, for 20 years ago and still a lot of people use it. It sort of started like that, right? Like it started this way and then people added things and it became a very big. Uh, and I think once you have that and it's a standard, it becomes a standard because people use it. It actually simplifies the lives of game developers because they don't need to re-implement locomotion. They just use it or they don't need to re-implement hand interactions. And it simplifies also the lives of many who just bring like their passport. This is how I interact. This is, and there is a learning curve also, right? You don't even need to be on any disability spectrum to need not to learn every time you enter a different game or yeah, you see. Thank you so much for that. I think we have one last question here for from Andres Leon. And his, his comment is, I want to help my 90-year-old mother with macular degeneration with AMD. I noticed that using a quest to in pass through help her to recognize better her surroundings. I was fascinated about the VR co-pilot and would like to see how can I implement it both in pasture and computer use. Who can I write to ask about it? I don't so know. So actually, I think uh, uh, Felix Thiel was on the chat and he said that he's one of the authors, you should contact him. Um, because actually they have a bunch of, uh, yeah, he's here. Okay. Do uh, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, sure. Um... We, we, we put it on, on, on GitHub so you can look yourself how we implemented it. Um, just, just from re reading what your, what your comment said, uh, you, you might find it a little bit tricky with a quest flow because everything is very closed off in the Oculus system. So the way we are doing this is that we have um, uh, 
using an undocumented we're using a library that uses an undocumented hook into the steam br interface so it only works for applications that are using steam br um uh, if, if if that's a use case that you that you're working with then that will do that will work um with a pass through, I'm not too familiar with how Oculus implemented a pass through and how it interacts with the Steam VR system. Um, but um, yeah, sorry, I can't help much with that. Um, would it be helpful if I just drop the, the GitHub link down in the in the chat and then you can look at yourself? Yeah. Also, I want to make a comment here that another thing that um, is very interesting from VR is how. For example, with macular degeneration, you can simulate it in VR and give people the experience of, so it, it can really help on um, visualizing certain disabilities to other people. This is how it feels to have Parkinson. Now spend a day like this. Now you will figure out uh, what type of problems you encounter and especially for people who do product design. Uh, this is very interesting, right? Um, to have access to a tool that can simulate different disabilities. I didn't enter into that in the talk, but I, I think it's also a very interesting path in which VR can actually make the real world more accessible. Uh, and what you were saying about having the see-through is partially because it's highlighting the, the, the contrast of the, the world, right? It's a bit like uh, um, Hang's work on seeing VR, but on reality. Yeah, um, with different disabilities and different situations, it, it gets really hard to, you know, think of designs for different situations. And I think that that is what hinders. Um, it's because there's no like one solution fits all. And I think that was also discussed in the comments. I'm um, adding here on the comment, the um, mm -hmm. uh, link to the workshop information. I'll soon be posting the list of papers and link to their GitHubs. And, you know, the, the whole idea is that people can go to that place and, and gather open source tools. And also, actually, the XR Access has a resource section on the website uh, that features very interesting work. And seeing VR is featured there. Um, perhaps the copilot could be featured there in, in um, some sort of link there, you know, there, I, I think that that's also a good aggregator. Yeah. Hi. I just want to jump in really quick. Um, I'm Shiri Asimha. Hi, everyone. I'm the uh, co-founder of XR Access, and I was on maternity leave last semester, so I'm back now. Um, Mar, since you mentioned Yu Hong and, and uh, seeing VR, I just wanted to mention that actually Yu Hong, who was Yu Hong Zhao, who was my PhD student, and now she's a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, one of the first projects that we worked together is called 4C, and that was a system where we took an Oculus and we used a see-through, the video see-through capability, um, and looked at how we can use that as an assistive technology. So we did find that people with low vision actually liked having um, the, the see-through capability, even without any additional um, help any yeah any, any additional um manipulations of the of the image so we because it in, increased the contrast and made things easier to see but then we also looked at how to how to use magnification contrast enhancement and um many of those other uh traditional and also some newer um manipulations of the image so anyway, that's called 4 c Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of all this line of work. I mean, I didn't want to go into much of what other people are doing because I can't imagine yeah. they will come here to <laughs> explain their work. I did want to give a, a glimpse a bit of, of this. And I, I'm, uh, of course, a big fan of the work um, she did with you and uh, you're doing and everything. So. Um, I Hello. Think. Yeah. This is uh, Jesse here. I just wanted to chime in for a second or two. Mm -hmm. um, just to kind of answer, help answer one of somebody else's questions earlier and then touch on uh, what you were talking about. I think, like I said, I was posting in the chat a couple of times and, 
as a legally blind user myself, um, I have a Rift, I have a Quest, original Quest, and I was really into VR for quite a while. And over the last year, year and a half or so, I've really kind of backed off a lot on it uh, because of just simply like all the workarounds that I need to do to get things to work or to be able to even just adjust settings or even use like the dashboards. And I think that's where as much as it helps having like, you know, for each individual experience or game is great. <clears throat> having something that is like platform wide or industry wide, uh, having that kind of a thing, because that way people can just, you know, have those accessibility features, like something like seeing VR um, across and every developer then does not have to think about, oh, how do I have to reinvent the accessibility wheel for their project? And I think that's why accessibility, whether it's VR or not, I think that's where it gets overlooked because it's like, well, we got to reinvent it and figure it out again ourselves. And so everyone keeps having to um, like repeat and try learning from the same mistakes over and over again. Um, but the other thing I really wanted to quickly mention for the macular degeneration thing, I, in my day job, I work professionally at state services for the blind here. And we work a lot with like low vision technology. And if the, if the goal is for the person to be able to see their environment, not necessarily what's in the VR headset, they do make actual, um, there's been a couple of companies, two or three different companies that have made they've taken either made their own headsets or in some cases taken like the Samsung gear VR and added their own kind of tools to it. Um, so like, it's not just like the grainy pass through image that you would see on something like a quest. If the person is really trying to see what's around them and even like feed their TV in via a transmitter via HDMI, um, the, the couple products I would definitely recommend looking into are the Iris Vision, I-R-I-S Vision, all one word. Uh, they're just coming out with a new version of the headset, which I haven't seen yet, but the existing one, it offers a pretty good field of view um, for the real world and different color contrast modes like you would typically find on a window or on a um, regular CCTV or magnifier. And then the Vision Buddy, is another similar type of one that also does magnification and color modes. But again, it has that little transmitter where you pass it through your TV, you pass the transmitter through to your TV or whatever HDMI source you want. And then you can basically, it, it wirelessly transmits your HDMI feed into the headset on a virtual screen. So like for seniors or for people who just like want to be able to have to be able to view their TV set in addition to their surroundings. Um, that can be a pretty good thing right now. It only works really well for passive things like watching TV uh, because there's a lot of input latency for like, if you were controlling a, uh, a mouse pointer via that way, or are controlling a video game that way, there's too much input lag. So it wouldn't work, but you know, it's early stages, but those are two things that I think might be helpful. Yeah, thank you so much. I didn't know the Iris uh, vision and it is clear, right? Like if you can do these augmentations of even just contrast, like uh, um, we were just saying with Siri. Yeah, they've taken what they do is they've taken like in the blind low vision field, they've taken the concept of like a vision, uh, like of a flat screen video magnifier desktop or handheld or even if you have like an iPhone and you open up the magnifier app, not the camera app, but the under the magnifier app under accessibility, it has these color contrast modes. So a lot of low vision users like to, for instance, have a dark background with light text. So because it's easier, it's, you know, for especially light sensitivity. So taking that flat screen concept, which in most cases, a lot of people can get by with either like, a computer program like Windows Magnifier or, or iOS or mm -hmm. Android or a, a CCTV because they don't want to wear something on their head all the time. But for situations where they want to be or need to be hands-free, like piecing yeah. together something or repairing something 
or whatever, um, that's where these headsets can really come in handy. Yeah, I think, uh, for example, the approach with seeing AI uh, from Microsoft Research is very much making use of things that people already have, like mobile phones, right? But I think it transfers very nicely to whatever other wearable later that has a camera. Yep, I want the commercial seeing AI pro or seeing VR project is, I want that like so bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Well, you can download the app and it's pretty good already, yeah? I have to say, but it's only for the mobile phone. All right, well, yeah, the seeing AI, but I mean the seeing VR. Ah, the seeing VR for VR. Yeah, yeah that's the, I'm waiting for a commercial version of a suite of tools yeah. like that. That's, I would kill for that right now. I think it's, it's so pressing that we come with the standards on these things because, you know, retrofitting a software is much harder than doing it well from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But it will happen because, um, especially if we start having uh, spatial computing tools for work, uh, there are legislations in countries that uh, really prevent you from having a office uh, post that is not accessible for everyone, right? So I think that only that is already such a big business case um, that uh, companies will pursue it. I think we are not seeing it yet so strongly because until now VR has been on the niche of gaming and gaming is just like, it has no regulation in that sense, right? They barely get this score that is kind of like for kids, for adults, for... <laughs> Um, but I think once you move things into the workforce, it becomes a serious uh, concern. So the metaverse hype might help on this aspect of the accessibility. Okay, so um, I'm, you know, everyone can find me on Twitter and I'm happy to answer more things later if they come and I think um, you're gonna have other people come later and talk about their projects and uh, I hope also I gave a bit of a um, different methodological approach or you know some ideas of how to start considering how to move things from this world in which nobody's thinking of accessibility into saying actually you seem like you're thinking a bit about accessibility so let's make it more obvious and let's um, move more people into working on both. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Dr. Mar. Um, Dylan shared in the chat uh, or one of our email addresses, and I believe that Mahika will be sharing our social media so that if anyone wants to get more involved with the XR access community, you feel free to hit us up on those links or social media. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, and uh, we will see you in future seminars. We are excited to have all of you here. Take care, everyone. <laughs>